pretty much seen as a high school leaving program, and I'd say the age range uh, would be 18, 19, 20 is, is the most common age range. 99% uh, of them having completed high school in Nunavut. Uh, we do have some young Inuit uh, who uh, we, we call urban Inuks who also attend the program, and, uh, and we have the odd person who's outside the Nunavut territory who may be a beneficiary of a different land claim, uh, Inuit land claim and who also attends. We used to call it transition, we don't anymore, okay. because we began to see that it's, uh, it's a program that stands alone in its own right. It's uh, accredited with Algonquin College. There's, we deliver two certificate programs here. Mm -hmm. And for many people, they see it as, as a beginning and end. That's the program they want to do. They go on to do other things. Now, it certainly does uh, carry out the functions of what a lot of transition programs do, in that it helps people prepare for further post-secondary study in an urban setting, but uh, many choose not to, and that's fine that the program stands alone. It's simply to provide an experience, a, a challenging uh, experience for young people in a supportive environment that will help them understand their world, help them understand their relationship with uh, the rest of Canada and with other Canadians and the, and the rest of the world, help them understand what's, what's going on in their world to make it what it is today. Uh, all, here we get into a bit of the, the coursework, but uh, uh, all young people know that uh, the era of their grandparents, or now their great-grandparents, uh, lived a totally different style of life. And they see the lives there, you know, the modern social media lives they're living today, and it's like, well, what, how did that happen? What happened? And so we just look to answer a lot of those questions. Even many who come from communities in Nunavut feel a bit of a disconnect because they, they, the ideas of what it means to be Inuk, what it, you know, what the values that go with it, the activities and traditions that go with it, many of them have not had the chance to learn those. And so they, they don't feel that they belong within that because they, they're, in some ways, they're marginalized internally. Uh, and then they're also sort of marginalized externally as a minority within Canada. So it gives them an opportunity to understand how all of that came about. And then a lot of the things that they do here in the program reconnects them uh, with that. So they, they end up uh, having a sense of, of connection and a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. Unlike most post-secondary programs uh, that are that are created because people see there's, there's a need for something or there's an opportunity for something, they create a program and then they go and look for students to take it. This one started just in the opposite way with students and a situation and we need to create something with them. So because it began within the land claims movement in the 80s and training field workers for working within the land claim organizations, taking information out to communities uh, and bringing information back. Uh, the 80s wasn't the same communications, especially with northern communities, that there are today. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, students got hired. They said, okay, the training program's over. <clears throat> but the students said, we learned a lot of interesting things there that we'd never heard about before. We didn't understand. And if you can keep it going, keep doing it. So we've been doing that every, er, ever since. But in doing that, it was like, what do you need to learn? What's most important to you? What's the story? And at that time, uh, we just started piecing together what the story was from different sources. Uh, from There was very few written materials at the time, explained that, from speeches that people made, from meetings, from having uh, people involved in the land claims movement, different leaders come in, just start piecing the story together of what's gone on in the Arctic over time. Uh, and it's through this, I, we almost call it a, an organic development within that the program developed out of that. So in the beginning, it was like a popular education program. There was no classes, uh, courses. Uh, there was no exams. Uh, there was no extensive homework assignments. It was really popular education. Uh, but the things we studied then are still many of the same things we study today. It's a much more formal uh, education process today as, a, as an institution, but it still has its roots in that, in, in the land claim, why there's a land claim, what it was meant to achieve, and the whole history that led up to to that and then what what is happening now and so that development meant that there was never real intention uh, what's it supposed to achieve it says what can we achieve 
with these young people and this situation and this this Canadian story that very few people know about, including themselves. And so over time we've pieced that together, built that together into a, what we think is a very cohesive now program. Uh, in the beginning, programs often uh, look on sort of knowledge acquisition, understanding, uh, look on skill development, which we focus on, a lot of academic skill development. But what we've come to realize is that the major benefit, the major impact of the program is on the student's own perception of themselves and who they are within Inuit society, who they are within Canadian society, and that sense now of connectedness, of pride, of respect for all those people who have gone before them, and uh, we often say whose shoulders they're standing on today, what that story is, because it's, it's a fascinating story. And it's, it's a story full of tragedy and hardship and pain, but also a story of, with great joy and achievements and, and success. So in doing that, people just, they become so inspired, they want to contribute, they feel they belong, they want to get engaged, they want to go back and play their role, play their part, which, which they're doing uh, en masse. Uh, so it's, I guess now if somebody said, what's the intent? It's, we've come to see it's that personal development which trumps everything else. They'll, uh, they'll forget a lot of what they may have learned in different classes, they'll forget what Article you know, 13 is in the land claim, uh, they'll remember it quick when they hear about it, but those things won't have the same significance as what they carry away in their hearts about who they are and the confidence that they can carry with them anywhere now. And that, that's the big game changer for, for us. In this situation, uh, and we, we, we haven't sort of, uh, we haven't uh, uh, gone proselytizing at all, saying we've got the answer to something here, but we've simply developed and refined over the years in working with students and using our own skill as educators and facilitators and trying to develop the best, most relevant experience possible for the students. The results for the students is that they say it's, you know, one of the best experiences they could have had. It's, it's often a turning point. For many of them, it's a fundamental, they'll, even 20 years later, they'll look back on that, that year as a time that really set them off in a new direction. And, uh, so success, I think so. That that's uh, for sure. There, there's people out there. You'll see. I have one photo here of a reunion we did several years ago, and people came back, and all you see is smiling, beaming faces because they're out there doing something. They're engaged. They're they've taken some control over their their lives, and they're doing things. And so for us to see that, they say, yeah, that's that's the role of of education. If the, we got to the end of the year and the students all just wanted to walk away and said, oh, I'm glad that's done with then what purpose would we be serving, you know? So it's, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that th the majority of students do stay. It's a very tough program, it's challenging. This, it's like an urban outward bound. Uh, this is a totally foreign environment and the stresses it can build up over time, it's exciting at first, but the stresses it build up over time are enormous. But a good 80% of them will stick it through the, the nine months. 80%? Yeah. And, uh, and it's because what they're learning is so compelling, and they're doing it together, of course. They're not alone. They're, they've got all their classmates around them. Many of them live together. But also, you know, what we say is the, the best and worst feature of the program is we're all in it together. Nobody has an office with office hours, you know, over in another building or down the hall. It's that we're right here <laughs> all the time. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, you know, it's, it's all of that, that relationship building and almost, and almost that family style approach to things that uh, we think helps people get through the, that tough experience. One of the most common things we we would hear right from the beginning, but each year when you get to graduation is very much like a, a crossing the threshold moment. You know, uh, we used to think, well, it's just a ceremony, you've done the year, fine, but it, it becomes a time where they reflect and they realize just what they've achieved that whole nine months of, of this hardship and and the stress of the demands of the program. And most commonly we would hear people stand up at graduation and say, I'm no longer ashamed to say I'm an Inuk. And, and now I proudly, I proudly wear that. And that was very, very common. It has been common all throughout from early years right till now. Uh, and a lot of times you wouldn't have known that. They don't wear it on their, sh on their shoulder while they're here. 
you wouldn't know by watching them. They're just normal young people doing what they do, but they're carrying a lot inside. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what they're learning here is helping them figure those things out and put things right. And, and we'll see people. We have, a, we have a young fellow this year who uh, we, start, we start the year off with orientation with students reading a, a short piece that was written by a, uh, a well-known Inuit leader back in the, in the 80s. And it's called Wasteland of Nobodies. You know, and talks about how the North and the Arctic was viewed uh, by outsiders. And we're reading that, and he's saying, you know, we have students reflect on that. Just a few sentences right at the beginning. You know, when you read this, what do you think? And there's one young fellow, he was just hanging his head the whole time, and, and he said, but, but isn't that who we are? And, and he's a star now here. He's, he's leading the way. He's outgoing. He's into the courses. He's doing, he's, he's finding things that are just putting that image right out of his mind. And, and so it's those transformations that we see quite often. That's a tough one. It is. Yeah. Maybe, uh... in, in some sense, in some ways, and, you know, maybe some people might take exception, but in the first sense, to me, there's some commonalities in what I see as education for all. That the fact that uh, students are indigenous, the kinds of things that they should be learning, is not different from, from students in other settings who have certain circumstances and certain histories should also be learning whether they're indigenous or not. Uh, so that right to a kind of education that allows you to have a strong sense of who you are in the culture that you're that you're in, uh, to me, it's universal. Uh -huh. uh, doesn't happen very often in our mass yeah, education it, system. It <laughs> so that's I think so that's where we say okay, how about indigenous? Because obviously the mass education system doesn't do the trick at all. It's, I mean it's counterproductive in so many ways. So for indigenous education, I think for me it's what you see here. If people can understand their story in ways. Uh, if, if they can look at the events of the past, if they can look at the circumstances of the past, but have a framework that allows them to see how all of those things are connected to a larger story. That their, what's been played out in their community, their family, their community, their region, is their story, but it's also part of a larger story that is common to Indigenous peoples everywhere. And I think to understand that, commonality, to understand that there's, there's been a certain dynamic, there's been certain structures at play over time uh, with different actors, but pretty much the same ideas, the same principles at play. I think to understand that so that people have an understanding of the world they're living in and what's shaped their world, uh, then allows them some agency to go out and participate in that world with a new perspective. So I guess if that's indigenous education, then that's what I would say is, in, you know, would be indigenous education, is being, understanding who you are in, in all its aspects, historically, currently, and going forward. Uh, our students will come with very little sense of what any First Nation group would represent or what cultures, and, but because they hear that First Nations, aren't they all the same? You know, yeah. and say, and then of course that that goes away through the years through the course of studies that we do because we do a long session on uh, uh, indigenous government, Inuit government relations, and the whole treaty story and and how that's played out. But yeah, they they start to learn, realize, you know, uh, a fellow, you know, a Mi'kmaq from from the east coast has absolutely nothing in common with you know a Haida person or Haida Gwaii other than. They belong to a special place on the earth, and they've developed a, a culture and a life to, to live happily and healthy there. I think two things. One is what I've described today, mm -hmm. that, that young people have that opportunity to, to learn that, to learn their story in that way, in ways that, not just to learn it as, a, as an academic exercise or as one piece, but in a way that connects it all together, as I've said, so that they can, they understand and they develop the skills to actually go out and act upon it and participate in that story uh, in a way that gives them confidence, in a way that 
provide gives them passion and, and uh, a sense of identity. Uh, but also, what I think indigenous education, I think it has to do with the non-indigenous population of the world of Canada, in that uh, everybody else should understand a lot of that story as well. And it's difficult to understand because every every part of the country has its own story. The peoples of those have their own story. But again, there's those commonalities, and not to lump them under one umbrella, but in some measure, perhaps learn one very, very well and say this is typical of all the other groups throughout the country. But I think that there's a, a huge role there and we start to see a little bit of that happening now, I think, as, as a result of the calls to action. We see school boards and that contacting us and, and in small ways. Yeah. But I think that also is a future because that, if there's going to be true reconciliation throughout the country, uh, then people need to know the stories. In the second year program, we have an advanced program that's part uh, university courses, part our own courses, uh -huh. and so I do a circumpolar studies course there throughout the year. And so they, be, you know, they're, you know, they read about uh, uh, shamans in Nanette's culture in Siberia, and say, but that's just like us. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, there's certain universalities, and, and they say, and, and even some then will come to say, they had it, they had it, and they had it. How come we all? And so far apart. Yeah, 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 yeah. We would love to support the development of similar programs like this. Uh, just last week we had several members, the Grand Chief of the uh, Cree in, in Quebec, with uh, people involved in education there, came and spent an afternoon. Uh, and perhaps, you know, they might want to develop. So we would love to support that kind of thing. I think we've seen enough now over the years that we're convinced there's something to this. It's not for everybody, but it does something special for certain people in certain situations. Uh, so we'd love to help out there. We're working on a, I guess we could call it a third year option, which is one that would combine, would, uh, combine Carleton University courses with actual place, work placement. Uh, because a lot of people, and particular gover government placement, not to learn how to be in government, but to understand government. Uh, the Nunavut government still quite young, still hasn't uh, come close to meeting its objectives in terms of Indian employment within the government, especially in the, the middle layers uh, of, of, gov of bureaucracy. And so this would be a program that, through the public administration at, at Carleton, where they would do uh, classes for a semester, uh, work in a government department for three months, classes, work in a government department, classes, work in a government department. So end up with a, a certificate in, in public administration, a certificate in public service, but also have some valuable uh, experience within government. And those placements would not be your typical co-op. They would be uh, highly mentored uh, and uh, would have component, large reflection components built in so that people are, are digesting their experience and what they're learning from it and then critiquing it. And, and hopefully in that way having a, a sense of confidence of understanding how governments work, but also a sense of confidence that they could then uh, do more within the Nunavut government and understand how they would like, like that to be.